Well, when we left, it was 1949, and the war was over in 45. Holland was kind of poor because of, of the war, of the German coming in. I don't blame the German soldiers, they were good people, but the, if the rule was in Germany, they did. It. But uh, they just dropped, uh, Holland was not left. And there was no work, that was one of the big things, except the factories, you could get a job in factories. But if you were born on a farm, you're not supposed to go anywhere near a factory, you know, you were supposed to be farming, which is long gone, that idea. When it came to us to get, uh, that we wanted to get married, there was no farm available, there was no farm, period. And a lot of, um, of uh, friends of ours were also talking about going to Canada, and we could have chosen another country too. But Canada was our choice because of the, the Canadian soldiers. They were they were really good to us, and, and they, are, they were really liked. We didn't like the Americans at all. They were, you know, with the boss. I don't know whether to say that, but. And the English, we could not get along with them at all, somehow. And the Canadians just clicked right in, and it always has been that way, and it still is today. The emotional moment was when we left the port of Rotterdam. And then that's further away, further away, the Icosa country, you see. And all I knew about Canada was uh, cowboys and Indians. That's the books we read, you know. We left Rotterdam, Holland, with the boat called SS Volta. Canada in 1950. Eight children, all under 10, in 1950. Eight children, mom and dad came over in 1950. In Canada, on the 17th of March. I still see Canada like a big country like you know. I came here as a bachelor, uh, got married, uh, became, no, I was a farmer. There was quite a mix of Dutch immigrants who, who landed in, in Nanakanish in particular, and uh, when you think of some of the families that came, it could have been a, a man and wife that were just... Uh, married and, and started their family here in Canada, or it could have been an, an older couple with, uh, with their children, you know, ranging from, from the uh, late teens to, to, you know, the, the uh, eight, nine years old and etc. So depending on their situations when they came, the opportunities were, were different for them as well. When we left Holland the 14th of April in 1951, we arrived in Quebec City on the 22nd of April, and we kind of sat on the boat for a day or two, because the immigration people were notified that our sponsors who were to take us in Ontario, in Windsor, Ontario, were not able to take us. So what were they going to do with a mother and father and eight children under ten? All of a sudden somebody came on the boat and I am not sure exactly if this was Father McIsaac or another person. They talked to my parents. They uh, knew that Bishop John R. MacDonald, who was the Bishop of the Diocese of Anakinish, was interested in getting large Dutch Catholic families to settle the bacon farms in Cape Breton. So they contacted him to see if they could take, take us. He said, by all means, send them down. We were on, we were on a train and they met us in, um, two priests met us in, in Truro. And it talks to anything is to Wong's restaurant. That's right, that was a good restaurant, they, they, they gave us a lobster supper. And they told them, you have a large family and you're Catholic. We're going to take you to Nova Scotia. So they took us to Nova Scotia. I have to say that there was a big difference whether you're in Quebec or in Nova Scotia. In Nova Scotia, it was like, gosh, almost, almost like home. I don't know why. The Catholic Church and uh, St. of X through the Mount Cameron farm played an integral part in uh, the success of, of many of the Dutch uh, people who lived here. Um, there was a priest by the name, uh, I believe it was a Dutch priest by the name of Father Renders who helped a lot of the Dutch families out and was a resource for farmers uh, in that area and he was able to help them out with some language problems and contacts and 
knowing when farms were available to buy and etc. And, and he was a really good contact in, in the local area for that. My father came over in 1950 and he, uh, he worked in Chubanacani for a year first and then we moved to Cape Breton and he, st he, uh, he didn't own the farm up there but he worked for, for another gentleman and uh, so then we started looking for another farm and we came down to Anaganish and we bought this farm. Dad bought a farm within three months I think when he was here or four months. Anyway after that we hoped as everybody, I guess, did at the time, help Dad on the farm. And in '58, I went two years to agriculture college, came back, and then bought. Uh, Dad decided to sell us the farm in 1965. We farmed for 35 years, and now we were able to transfer the farm over to our son. I was still living in Halifax, but coming once in a while here looking for a farm, and of course. There was lots of farms for sale, but to find the right place, like, you know, they were not expensive either. $2,000, $3,000 was a more expensive one, but you, you have to look at the money too. Uh, well, we found a farm in Lock Harbor. And then through Arda, it used to be... Um a program that the government had years ago whereby if you if somebody wanted to sell a farm uh, an, an older farm or, or with some land on it and you didn't have the money to buy it they'd buy it for you and you could lease it for five years and at the end of the five years if you wanted to you could you could uh, buy it or you could lease it again for another five years and that's how we got uh, a couple of farms up the river and some some meadow land too the Nova Scotia Land Settlement Board uh, also provided opportunities for, for many of the families through, uh, through the ability to buy farms. And uh, that Land Settlement Board is now known as the, the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board, but they, they provided opportunities and assistance to allow these new immigrants to purchase farms. Of course, we bought a farm at $2,500 of the whole farm and we didn't have the money. And the Land Settlement Board put up, oh, Fifteen hundred dollars, and then the church, the diocese, want farms where people were all going to the states. There was, there was no money in farming then for them anyway, and they want more farmers, and they thought that the Dutch were good farmers, so they, uh, the diocese supplied money to those immigrants that came and bought a farm. So we borrowed a thousand dollars to make up the twenty-five hundred. First, they had milk cows right from the beginning. He had seven cows and some young cattle. I raised some poultry and we worked and worked till I got a melac water. You didn't have a melac water, you had to ship your melac for, for cream, like, you know. That's not very much money. Finally we got one cow and in the end we have three cows and then on Sunday morning to go to church, well, she would go with the neighbor, there was only one mass and when you come from Holland and if you don't go to church you may as well say goodbye to yourself because that was a must, of course. And I would go milk the two or three cows by hand, in that time you're not allowed to eat before mass, and then I go on the bicycle to go to the 7 o'clock mass in Adianis, which is that 10 kilometers. A little by little, we went ahead. I would, I would work locally, go out to work too, on a telephone line or whatever little jobs I could get. And little by little, we, we, we went ahead. And uh, then we were able to buy, believe it or not, 500 acres of land for $500. A dollar an acre, that's all, you know, that time. And another 200 acres for $300 with the best wood lot you could ever, ever dream of ever. And there we, I would go out in the morning and cut pulp and not much money in it, but little by little, by little we, we made it. But there were small dairies, you know? Yes, oh, yes. There were very small dairies. Yes. There were a lot of small dairies at yes. that time. Wasn't it mostly cream, though? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, 
Well, it's easy for people because people had their own milk. Yeah. You know, there were some people that would deliver from the farms, and you didn't have to worry about pasteurization or anything like that. They put it in a bottle and they, you know, took the horse wagon and delivered to a mom here and a mom there, or a household here and a household there. Yeah. And that, you know, was satisfied a lot of the milk. Let me see. Our first um, cream sack, we only could deliver, we only could. Uh, oh, yes. That's deliver right. cream to, uh, to the dairy. Our first cream sack was $7.20 for the for the month. The whole month? For the whole month. And the second one was 50, something like $15. Yeah. And we were rich. Yeah. So. And it was a privilege to ship milk for the last of the time. Not too long after. Finally, we shipped milk. And by God, the income went up to $50 a month for the milk sack. We were a rich boy. As we thought it was. Yes. We bought our milk quota in uh, seven, in '64. We were looking for a quota, and at the time they were kind of hard to come by too. They weren't real expensive, but they didn't want to switch the quota so much from one uh, from one person to another because this farm, when we bought it, it didn't have a quota on it. So uh, we had to go and get one. We uh, we we gathered up some cattle, and then in uh, in '64. Uh, we bought a milk quota in Cape Breton. There was a lot of changes in agriculture in the early 50s. Agriculture was becoming industrialized. Uh, technology was vastly improving after the Second World War. Uh, Three-point hitches on tractors and power takeoffs were just starting to becoming popular on, on tractors and new models were coming out on the dairy industry in Nova Scotia and particularly Cape Breton and Anaconish counties. But the modernization of bulk tanks and uh, the ability to produce milk uh, 12 months of the year rather than the seasonal spring and summer months, allowing families to have milk for their children 12 months of the year, was a lot of change in agriculture. And uh, one of the, the common things with the, the Dutch farmers is that they were very uh, acceptable to change. And uh, they adapted quickly to this new technology and to the change. And uh, as a result, they, they were able to survive and to change with the times. The Canadian that time, he wouldn't borrow money if he died from hunger. He would not borrow money. Everything had to be taught in other words, he didn't buy it. He didn't use fertilizer very little, you see. And as I said, the cattle in the woods, a uh, neighbor I worked with making hay, and sometimes, and it was hot days in the morning, and cows had bells, you know, to find them. But this, they were pretty smart, and they uh, so still. Sometimes it was 10 o'clock before he got his cattle home and milked the cows, and then we go heeing, you see. And uh, we had them right in the field, you see. But the neighbor said, You can't do that, John. And the grass is, you have to leave it there because the frost will kill it, and you have nothing next year. But there was even more next year, you see. They reinvigorated, I guess, is. Uh one of the ways you could put things, the agricultural uh, industry in this particular area. They took over a lot of farms and they used the land to its full potential uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, they were also a people that became very involved in their communities. Uh, they contributed a lot to uh, the social and cultural life of, uh, of their communities. They integrated very well with the people. They. Uh, made it a point to make themselves at home. We are Canadians. We're all Canadians, by the way. You know? And uh, it's something that that you can't put in words. To have a piece of property, you know, the the world is getting smaller all the time. To have a piece of property, a farm, I think, is uh, in time to come. Canada's only a young country. It's only a you know, a hundred and some odd years old. So there's a lot of things can happen. And if you have some land that you were, that's yours, you know, that you can live on, and I think it means a lot. Uh, many of the farms are, are still going today. And, uh, you know, they're, they're second or third generation Dutch families that are operating them. And, uh, and largely amount the successes of these are the hard works that those original families had, had put into, uh, into agriculture.